If you're a Christian family man, why does it seem sometimes like church is failing you? The challenges we face as family leaders can feel overwhelming. You got to pour into your kids, pour into your marriage, protect, provide, and make decisions that build up your family. It's not an easy thing to do, and when you're trying to walk a Christ-centered path, it adds even more pressure. So the question is, how do we manage this pressure, and who should we entrust with helping us to lead our families effectively? What's going on, fellas? I want to welcome you to Alpha Dad Consulting. I am your host, G. Vidal, and on this show, we focus on helping family men rise above the challenges they face as husbands, fathers, and providers to embracing their role as a leader so that they can create the life at home they truly desire. We do this by bringing you tactics, strategies, resources, and conversations with incredible men who are playing this game of being a family leader at a high level. In today's episode, I had the honor and privilege of interviewing my good friend slash brother, Brian Hunt. Brian is a Texas-based Americana singer slash songwriter who blends honest lyrics with a raw sound. He spent 10 years focusing on the development of his songwriting. During this time, he chose not to play, learn, or sing music by other artists. This approach allowed Brian to grow organically as a musician and to develop an individual style and sound. Brian co-produced his debut album called Headed Out West and his sophomore album The American Dream, which was recently released with Texas country legend Phil Pritchett. And to top it off, he is also a U.S. Army combat veteran who served proudly for this country. He's done some incredible things, but none of his accomplishments come close to the one thing that he's most proud of, which is being a devoted Christian family man. This is one of the biggest reasons I wanted to bring him on the show. Brian is a family leader through and through, and I've witnessed firsthand how he serves and pours into his family. Please enjoy our conversation as he shares some of his insights surrounding family leadership, the state of the church, and how it deals with us as men, music, and much more. You're not going to want to miss this. Let's go. I can see the enemy approaching the battleground Hear the drums pound like a thunder sound loud I gather up my cow to prepare them for what's coming We've been summoned Mr. Brian Hunt, welcome to Alpha Dad Consulting, man Thanks, uh, It's It's awesome to have you here I'm glad that, um, that you, you're able to find some time To be able to make some time for your boy here And come on to, to our show <laughs> It's my pleasure, man I've been looking forward to it Absolutely, man, I appreciate it Um all right, bro. Well, there you are a man of many talents, you know, on top of being a singer songwriter. Um, you also have, uh, you know, a pretty great career, uh, in, in your engineering career that you have on top of that, you are a devoted husband, a devoted father. Uh, and you are also a fellow Apogee brother, you know, Apogee man. Um, so I want to dive into different kind of elements of that and different elements of your role and, and how you go about fulfilling those roles. Uh, but what I want to start with you on is I want to kind of start with uh, just kind of a little bit about your background, man. Um, you know, what was it like growing up as a hunt in your family? Uh, and, you know, specifically, you know, what, what kind of dynamic did you have uh, with your dad in terms of your relationship, right? And things that uh, you learned from him and that kind of thing. And you took into your adulthood that, you know, that'd be an awesome place to start if you're cool with that. Yeah, of course. Um, so I grew up in Texas, in Southeast Texas, in a small town called Lumberton. And I'm the youngest of four boys. So I learned how to even the odds pretty quickly. Um, grew up outside in the woods, you know, barefoot, chasing, um, chasing animals and building forts and just being a boy. And so my parents did a really good job letting us be boys, essentially, and to to run and play and do all the things that boys need to do, be outside. And, um, so I had a good, a good upbringing. My parents both, uh, worked really hard to provide and to, uh, give us opportunities that they didn't have and also to protect us. Um, and so specific to my dad, my dad, the, the biggest legacy that, that he left, um, is he was a, he was and is a follower of Christ. And that's something that he really drilled home to all of us, you know, growing up. That that's what our our world was centered around, and I'm so grateful for that uh, opportunity to grow up that way, and to have had a dad who was serving Jesus in the best way that he knew how. And so that that's quick picture. You can dive in more specifically if you want. Yes, sir. No, that's great, man. Um, 
what I wanted to ask you is, uh, this is kind of interesting because it was something that we talked about uh, when you and I first met, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And even on some of the initial mentor calls that you had or that we had is that you you said something that really resonated with me, which was um, that you had gotten to the point in life where you sort of had everything that you ever wanted. Mm-hmm. Right? Do you remember saying that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I, what I wanted to know is if you could kind of expand on that in terms of what you meant by that, right? And and talk about kind of what are the things that that like you that made you feel that way, right? Um, and then also with that, right, with that feeling of all that, what kind of prompted you to sort of jump into like a men's group, like Apogee, right? Being at that state of mind, um, I was just curious as to what kind of made you say, okay, well, you know, I have everything I've ever wanted, but there's more, right? So um, I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I had, you know, goals as a young man and I was able to accomplish those goals and to maybe I set my goals low, too low. Um, But I got to this point where I had accomplished everything that I ever wanted to do. I had everything that I ever wanted, you know, and it was a really weird place to be. And, um, there, there's a, there's the idea that you can buy the bigger house and it's not going to make you any happier. You can, you can have the car and material things are empty essentially. And so I had gone down that path in my twenties and realized that, you know, there's not, there's not really a lot to it that way. And so, so, um, so I was at this point where I was wrestling and, you know, there, there's, um, I'm a, I'm a big believer. And so we can make idols in our lives, you know, and work can be an idol and good things can be idols too. And so just kind of at, at this point of, um, reevaluating everything. And, and so whenever, you know, whenever we started having kids, um, you know, it made me want to understand my faith a lot more and to go down that rabbit hole and the process of going down that rabbit hole. Um, if you really study, I believe that it changes you. And, and, um, if you spend time in God's word and it, it shapes you and it, you know, it opens your mind to to different idols in your life, essentially, you know. And so um, that's what I meant by that. And so I was at this point where I'd accomplished, you know, almost everything that I'd ever wanted to do. And I'd done, you know, all my bucket lists minus just a couple, you know. And I, so I haven't done dog sledding. I haven't seen the Borealis lights. And I want to see the Great Wall of China. And outside of that, I've kind of done the things that I wanted to do. So, so there's a, there's a season of midlife that doesn't get talked about a lot with men where you have this, this opportunity, um, to either go back to the things you did before or to continue moving forward. And, um, a lot of men will go buy a motorcycle or a sports car, or they'll change careers and they'll try to recreate their twenties or their thirties or whatever it is. And that's that midlife crisis. Um, and so what I started to do was to go back in my mind and to look at men who I had seen go through that and who had come out on the other side. Well, and, Hmm. and whose kids were doing well, as adults in healthy relationships, had their kids, kids of their own. And, and I started to evaluate that. And, um, so I read Tim Kennedy's book, Scars and Stripes, and I was just like, man, this is a great book and it's really humble and authentic and, um, just true, you know? And, and so I was following Tim Kennedy and, and he started posting about Apogee and, the the one sub caveat is that I was looking for men, for real men that I could be around that were um that were really trying to get better. And so I, I call a lot of men Peter Pan boys and they don't really want to grow up and um uh, they may be married with kids and you know, they're just kinda going through the motions and they're passive and and I was sick of that man and I, I just wanted to find 
some good men that I could walk with that were trying to get better and, and selfishly men and leaders who were further along than I was that I could trust and learn from. And so that's, that's kind of what led me to Apogee and, uh, applying and just taking really a step of faith. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. I thank God that you did. <laughs> Cause me too. Yeah. Man. yeah, man. It's, uh, it was definitely, I think we talked about this, but it was definitely like an answer to prayer, right. Um, mm-hmm. and, and joining and, and getting the, the brothers that, that we've had and that we have in our lives now, which is awesome. And the leaders too, man. The leaders. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, cool, man. I love that. And what I wanted to get into is, uh, Switching gears a little bit, um, jumping into faith. You know, you talked about how your dad uh, kind of set that example in terms of being a follower of Christ, right, and being a believer. Uh, but what I was curious about is when did you, you know, kind of become, you know, start following Christ? Uh, you know, you, we play around in our, you know, teens and all that, and, you know, maybe we're going to church and we grow up around it. But um, there's certain things that I think have to happen sometimes in our lives for us to take it seriously. Right. And, and right. live out the life. Um, and I was just kind of wondering where, where that was for you and, you know, what specifically convinced you to believe in God and, and say like, okay, yeah, like he's real and he has a purpose for my life. Yeah. So for me, I grew up, <clears throat> I grew up, uh, you know, really religious and going to church probably three times a week. Um, and, you know, I went through a period where I wasn't really sure about my personal relationship with God. And, um, and then through a series of events that I won't get to in the details on basically ended up back on my knees and, uh, putting all my, all my faith in God, just taking a step of faith. And that led to several steps of faith and, then I ended up at a church in Corpus Christi called uh, Church Unlimited under a pastor, Bill Cornelius, on an Easter Sunday. And he talked about uh, God's grace that day. And he had these whiteboards set up all through the church. And you would go up there and write down the sins that you struggle with. And he talked about the cross and, you know, how Jesus stands in between us and Father God and uh through Jesus' sacrifice, Father God sees us as perfect. And at the end of the service, he went and erased all the whiteboards before everybody left. And uh, that was a really profound moment for me because I grew up in a legalistic type of religion. And that's when I really started to understand the doctrine of grace and how... um how Jesus died for us and what that really meant. And so I'd heard it my whole life, but for some reason that day was the day that it clicked for me. And, um, so I ended up getting baptized in um, in somebody's house in their bathtub in a life group situation shortly after that. And, um, yeah, it's just been a journey, you know, since then. And, um, the, the process of, you know, trying to be like Jesus sanctification and dying to self and, you know, studying the Bible and trying to understand what it all means. And, um, yeah, that, that's kind of how that happened. And it's just been the best thing that's ever happened to me. And, um, yeah, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, man. That's awesome, man. Yeah. There's something to be said about, um, you know, I've, I've witnessed a bunch of preachings and preachers my whole life. Right. But, uh, the act of, of how he demonstrated that, right. Bill Corne- right. Cornelius, you said his name was mm-hmm. right. That's right. Um, you know, how he demonstrated your, your scenes being wiped off. Like he gave you sort of a physical demonstration of, you know, illustration, right. what, what that was like. And, uh, it's, it's amazing how much impact that type of thing has versus just like preaching, right? Like just getting up on a pulpit and just, you know, reciting a verse and trying to get you. And God like, said. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, bro. And I got the Hispanic side, right? So mine oh, was like, yeah. you know, hermanos. <laughs> like it, was, oh, man. it was like that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, man, it's very monotone, like no excitement, like no, you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, and no. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, it's rough, man. <laughs> In some places it's rough, but, uh, having guys that can kind of step outside 
like that and and find different ways of relaying the message so that it clicks uh, mm-hmm. i think that's that's beneficial man for sure absolutely yeah so um with that what i wanted to ask you is you know so aside from god and your family right mm-hmm. what else drives you to want to keep growing and becoming uh better in every area of your life i mean the alternative isn't very good to just stay the same I come from a small town and um, to just not progress and grow is like not an option. It's not how I'm wired. And, and when I was a younger man, I had, you know, some seasons where I tried that out and I was miserable, man. So it's personality. It's who I am. And to do anything else is being insincere for me. And if you look at the fruit of that, you know, if you just stay complacent and passive and don't grow in the moment, um, it, it doesn't work out very well, you know, even in the best case. So you got to live life, man. For sure. For sure. Yeah. No, man, I'm, I'm the same way, dude. Like it's, it's the same thing. I feel like if I'm, if I'm stagnant, and I'm not moving forward. I mean, you're always moving in a direction, right? Like you're never really stagnant. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're not doing something to actually better yourself or improve yourself every day, it's like you're, you know, you're going to live an existence that is probably not going to be fruitful, right? And uh, I look at that sometimes with, you know, um, some family and some friends that I've seen that you know, grown up over the years and we're still close and we're still connected and all that. But, you know, they're, they're still kind of talking about old things that happened in the past, right? Or maybe they're holding on to like grudges or family issues and they can't get past some, you know, some aunt said something about this uncle and you know what I mean? And like, it's just, it, it's, there's no growth, man. There's no grace. There's no forgiveness. And, you know, it just, they just stay in that and they live in that for the rest of their lives or for many years, um, and I, I think, you know, the, the quicker we can kind of come to, to realize that doing that is not beneficial for you nor your family, especially if you're a family leading man like us, right? Um, it's, it's just not going to bode well for you. So, um, so I, I, I'm glad you, you shared that because it's true, man. Growth needs to happen for sure. Yeah, it has to, man. Um, cool. So I wanted to get into, this is, uh, another, another interesting thing is, uh, So, you know, as you know, like I grew up kind of uh, in the church as well uh, from the age of 14, right? 13 is when I started going. 14 is when I started kind of taking it a little bit more seriously, started doing the rap thing, Christian church, uh, Christian hip hop, right? Going to all these different churches and youth events and, you know, and all that, right? And I got to see so many different denominations and so many different doctrinal beliefs and uh, preachers and all this stuff, right? Um, but one of the things that that I would never see, right, at all these churches, or not never, but I would say that it was a rare thing to see, is that they had it like kind of like a strong men's group, mm. right? Like their their men, um, either it was dominated by mostly women coming with just their kids and their husbands weren't there, right? right. Um, or it was, uh, you know, like the male presence was just maybe in the leadership, like the deacons and maybe the pastor, right, and all that. Um, but there seemed to be a very, like a lack of men right there that were leading and, and being believers. Uh, and what I wanted to ask you is in, in your opinion, like, where do you think the church sort of fails us, right? As men, um, that sort of forces us to look outside of the church for men's groups and like, like we did with Apogee in a sense, right? Um, And I just kind of wanted to get your input on that. If, you know, from your experience growing up in church yourself, um, what do you see that could change there or that need that that's lacking there? Yeah. I mean, I would take biblical examples like Samson, like David, Um, you know, they were warriors and David's a warrior poet. And uh, that's what comes to my mind. And so, you get into certain groups and there's more of a openness around that 
Um, I don't know that I have the answer. And I would say that any, any organization that has man in it is flawed and just general, you know, um, blanket statement. And so, um, you know, the church is going to be flawed in some sense because it has man in it, um, running it. And, and so there, there is a political correctness that comes with Christianity, cultural Christianity in America and where you're not allowed to talk about certain things or you used to not be able to, and you can't really have dialogue and you have to fit in the box of, you know, this and men, I don't think men like that. I think that men who really want to know, you know, where they fit and how they fit into that system or organization um, may have questions that aren't um, addressed, you know, from the pulpit or if you bring it up or look down upon or um, there's a lot of politics and, you know, men don't really like politics in, in a sense. And so um, that's a really big question. Yeah. And I, the, the last thing I'll say is that there's an opportunity for um, for men to either run away from it or to stand up and set the example and, and be, you know, the warrior poet in, in the environment. Because what if, what if we all just go somewhere else and don't show up and, you know, don't, well, weigh in on the status quo of what's normal at the time, you know, then where does that lead to? Yeah. It doesn't lead anywhere good. So I, I think it starts in the home and there's a personal responsibility. This is going a little bit different direction, but I think that it's important for fathers and mothers to teach their children about uh, Christ in, in the home. You know, it's not the church's responsibility to teach our kids. It's our responsibility to teach our kids yeah. about God. And um, I think the biggest issue is the cultural Christianity aspect where people grow up in a quasi Christian environment and yeah. they, they think that they have a personal relationship with God based upon just kind of, you know, going to church once a week and, and there's not a lot of depth. And so I think that's a bigger issue than the lack of men, um, and I would say that men want to follow real men, you know? Yeah. And if there's not real men in those environments, then why are the men going to go there? Yeah. No, I agree with you, man. Um, yeah, I, I've seen, you know, I've seen with, with, certain churches right like the the doctrinal stuff like uh and like you're saying like the culture that that's there right that's widely accepted um like there's a stigma that goes along with it right like being a church goer being mm -hmm. uh, somebody that goes every sunday or so and then when you're there um there's certain things that you can't talk about or you can't say right and 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 I think that uh, with with all the problems that are going on in the world right now and you know the the stuff that's going on in schools, right? Every, everything that's going on, mm -hmm. like these are conversations that we need to be able to have. Right. Um, and even, you know, when you're going to church and like, sometimes you have a question about a verse, right. That doesn't make sense to you that you're like, Whoa, like, what is, what does this actually mean? Like, or what's the interpretation here? Right. Like what, is, or is God contradicting himself here? Right. Like so those questions come up and uh, it, for me, it used to be kind of taboo talking about that. Right, bringing up passages that um, would mm -hmm. technically maybe contradict or something like that, and um, and pastors would uh, that I dealt with like would run away from something like that. They wouldn't, Absolutely. you know what I mean? And, and yeah, I do know. Yeah, so and you they, can't have those real conversations, and like there's like you were talking about growth, right? Like how can you grow in your faith and your spirituality that way, right? Yeah, there's a political correctness yeah. again that that yeah. kind of ensnares. Um, and keeps from certain conversations happening. So there's a guy named Mark Driscoll, pastor. Yeah. And I've he, seen him. he's not a perfect stuff. man, I don't think, but he, uh, he talked about a lot of the things 
that men needed to hear about. Um, and so there was a period, you know, where I followed him and his teachings. Um, he was talking about it, man. You know, and there wasn't a lot. Yeah. And, and, and to, to respond, yeah, I've had the moments where I've asked about this scripture or, you know, this, why does the Bible say this? And, and there's like a, you know, a pushing, oh, let's change the subject, you know, and go yeah. over here instead. And uh, yeah. an unwillingness to really take the deep dive and, and have the conversation. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like the school thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sit down and shut up mm -hmm. and do what you're told, right? Yeah. And um, as opposed to. I have a personal responsibility. The Bible says to seek out your salvation with fear and trembling. I have a personal responsibility for me and for my wife and for my kids to understand, right? Yeah. And either you're helping me or you're not, you know? And if you're not, then you're holding me back essentially from doing that. And, um, you know, I'm gonna go somewhere else and I'm going to find, find good men that I can learn and grow with and from. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Um, I don't think I've ever told you this story, but, um, when I was, I was like 16, 17, you know, I got into like youth leadership. Uh, so I was doing the youth leader thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was, I was one of the younger guys. I was like my cousin, my older cousin was, was another youth leader. One of the guys that I grew up with as well. Um, and so during that time I started, kind of preaching, like I started diving into actually preaching like the youth sermons, really the youth, youth groups and that kind of thing. So dipping my toes in that side. Uh, and it was cool, man. It was, it was cool kind of learning, um, how to break down a passage or read some scripture and try to extract lessons from it and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember during that time, my mentor, who I call pops, he, uh, he had uh, he had grown up in in different churches as well, and um, his belief, his understanding of of the word, like he he always had the the thing like, hey, don't believe me because I said it, but believe me because believe it because you read it, like because right. you actually read the the yeah. scripture, and you know always check me against that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, I was going to a Baptist church, and ironically, uh, one of the verses that I came across was kind of the importance of baptism. Right. Uh, and the belief that I that I have and I still hold this is that it, it's that it's essential to your salvation. Right. Like that it's it, that's a part of it, essentially. Um, and so that was, you know, reading it from Scripture and all that. And that was something that uh, and there was, you know, those verses and things like that to support that. Right. Um, not that not to say that it's, you know, that it's because there was a lot of belief on the Baptist church that it was like just like a step of obedience and this and that. And I'm not trying to argue doctrinal differences here, but what I'm saying is that when I came across that verse and, you know, it sparked that thought to me, I'm like, okay, well, you know, if it's, if it's not essential, then why is it in here? If it is essential then you know, why did Jesus do it? And all, you know, like all these questions started to come about. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I remember I went and I actually preached the sermon on it, just posing the questions and just kind of like, Hey, Let's talk about this because I don't think we're in a Baptist church and we've never really talked about why baptism is important in this and that. Like in in that church, the way the only way that we could become leaders or uh, go into uh, worship and ministry, be part of the worship team, that kind of thing, was if we got baptized. That was the requirement. Like you needed mm -hmm. to get baptized in order to serve, and and that was what they told us. But then when we, when I started kind of digging in, I was like, is that is that the like is that what it says though? Like yeah, I can't. I can't sing at church if I don't get baptized. And, you know, and when I started posing those questions and kind of poking and prodding, man, like we got, we got like, we got canned, like essentially, like we, we became kind of me and one of my other buddies, like we became kind of ostracized and pushed aside and we were put on what they call discipline. Right. Yeah. Um, where they, they told us that like, you know, you guys are, they called us false prophets. Like it was crazy, dude. Like it was like, yeah. you know, we, we were, we were like, we were cast out essentially. Uh, and nowhere at any point that anybody decide like, Hey man, can we come to an agreement? You know, can we sit down and just kind of open up the word and talk about like, let's talk about these differences. Let's talk about where are you getting your thoughts, your interpretation from where am I getting 
like, you know, and let's find a, a, a through line here and, and figure this out. Um, but instead we got, uh, I remember specifically, we got tricked into a meeting, right? Uh, and this was, this was kind of interesting is that they told us we were going to, we were going to prep for the father's day event. Right. Mm. Um, and they told me and the other leaders, they're like, Hey man, like, let's, uh, we're going to have a meeting, uh, you know, come in here. Uh, and we're going to prep for the Father's Day event that we're going to have in a couple of weeks, you know, for Father's Day. We just need to plan it out and all that. Cool. I'll be there. I show up, dude. And like all the fathers, all the men of the church are there. <laughs> like they're all present, you know, every single one of them. Um, and I'm like, whoa, I thought we were going to do like a Father's Day thing. And they're like all the fathers are here. What's going on? Right. Uh, completely blindsided, dude. And And in that meeting, like I get scolded, like scolded, yelled at, like. You know, saying that I am yeah, like that I'm follow like because Pops is my mentor, like I'm following a false prophet. I'm following this and that. And like I've never seen these men who I respected, who I grew up kind of looking up to uh, in one quick like in one split second turned on me, man, like and became completely different. Like you saw the humanity, the human side, right? Yeah. You put, being a young man, you put these guys on a pedestal saying like, oh, they can do no wrong and this and that. And that's where I saw the reality of it and, and the reality of how much uh, the doctrinal influence and, you know, what they grow up on traditionally in, in different churches, right? What they grow up accepting to be true and anything that comes in to even challenge that a bit, they're, they're quick to protect it and they're quick to not even um, entertain some different idea, you know, that's coming from the same Bible that they're reading out of. So maybe that's long winded. I just wanted to share that story because it just kind of goes in line with what you were talking about, the politics and everything that goes on. Cause you know, I experienced them and it left a it left a bad taste in my mouth in terms of the church experience, right? So now I'm uh, I think even now I still struggle with that. I'm very guarded when I go to a church or I visit a church because of that, because I'm I'm always weary of like, ah man, like are you you know, are you going to turn on me? Are you going to like, can you, can we engage in actual conversation, right? Without any emotion or any impulse happening. So uh, I yeah. just thought that was an interesting thing. So. Yeah. Um, I've experienced some things and um, yeah. I would say that if it's, if it's truly top down, you know, versus mm -hmm. culture up, um, if you really are, you know, passionate about understanding the Bible and what it says, and students of, you know, God's word, as opposed to what happens is there's a lot of different doctrines and everybody thinks that they have it right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. And then there's yeah. this pride and this arrogance that comes up about our grouping of beliefs, you know, our theology um, is better than theirs. And that, in my opinion, from what I've experienced is where pride and arrogance and, um, the vision comes in. And so yeah. two things, one, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep it top down. It's about what the Bible says. And the other thing is that anytime, this is just my opinion, but anytime you have a group of beliefs that you put at, um, doctrines, essentially you put at the equivalent of the Bible, mm -hmm. then it's pretty, uh, rare to find that where you don't have some of that pride and that arrogance and some of that, um, you know, the, the keepers of the gardens, so to speak, where, you know, if there's what they call a weed in there, they're going to pull you out and throw you in the fire because mm -hmm. it challenges, um, what they're saying. So whenever I was growing up, I would ask certain questions and I wouldn't get any response. It would just be, <clears throat> all right, Brian, you know, and, and then again, change the subject or move somewhere else. And I was like, all right, well, or I would get responses that were superficial. And, um, and I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go test this for myself because my sense tells me that, you know, you're not being completely honest with me, you know, and you're not answering my questions and, um, you know, something as simple as like, drinking a beer, you know, like, why is it bad to drink a beer? Oh, it's horrible. Well, why is everybody doing it? Yeah. You know, as opposed to someone being honest and saying, well, it's actually, you know, not really a good thing. Um, if you drink too much and whatever. Yeah. So that's just one example. Um, and kind of a, 
trivial or pedestrian example, but it's an example of if we can't be real with people about, you know, from, from a biblical standpoint about, you know, Jesus was accused of being a drunkard, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, um, they will never tell you that in church. Mark Driscoll <laughs> brought that up, you know, it's in the Bible, you know? So there, there's a lot of that. And, you know, you go, go to any church in the Dallas area and you bring that up and see how that goes, man, it's probably not going to go too well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Now you go to, in, where I grew up in LA, man, you go to any Hispanic church and you'd bring that up and it's probably not going to go too well. Too. It's in there. And that's the thing is yeah. we can't pick and choose what's in there. And we also can't take things out of context. And so one of my favorite things is can, is doing a canon study, mm-hmm. you know, studying the whole Bible and then testing the Bible against itself. And so you're talking about baptism. And again, yeah. I don't have to argue theologies or doctrines or anything. But um, if you start digging into that stuff like you did and read and ask questions, then that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing, right? And that's what the Bible tells us to do. And if you go back to like uh, Jacob who wrestled with God, you know, and got named Israel because he wouldn't let go, you know, like that's what we're supposed to do, right? We're not supposed to go and fall into some straight line, you know, one, two, three, that's what we want coming out of a school society, you know, as, as we want some, it's a, some step-by-step thing, but it's a personal relationship, man. And you have to spend time and do the work, um, to have a personal relationship. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I love that, dude. That's, thanks for, uh, Thanks for not scolding me on the. Uh, oh, no, man. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I'll say this: like uh, I'm not perfect. I'm still learning, yeah, you know. And same. and my, so I I don't want to come across as someone who knows it all because I don't. I'm just trying to uh, follow Jesus and study and learn, you know, more about Him. Um, and that's it. So I'm I'm just talking where I'm at and yeah. what I've learned from the past. And I'm I'm not a perfect person, and I'm also a flawed man, and I need Jesus. Um, and he has grace every single day. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, cool. This is, uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit because I want to get into some of the, the music stuff, man, because that's, uh, that's another big, big part of, uh, what just happened this last week, your release of a new album, yeah. uh, the American dream. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys got to check it out. Uh, I got to tell you, you created new fans in my household for sure. Oh, um, cool, man. cause yeah, I was. Uh, we were listening to the album on on Friday. We're driving to um, to Eli's uh, appointment, his uh, his like one month checkup or so. Uh, and you know, as we were driving, I started playing the album and just kind of see what they would say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and my wife, uh, CO, she's like, "Who's that?" You know, I'm like, "Oh, that's Brian." You know, and she's like, "What? No way!" You know. Uh, and then I told Ethan to, that's Mr. Brian, dude. He's like, what? That's Mr. Brian. Yeah. So he's hearing it. Um, and he likes, uh, leaving you. That's his song. He, oh, he cool, likes that song. Man. Yeah. He likes this song. Um, I like that song. I like the title track as well. The American dream. Um, the, uh, uh, someone to hold, I think is another one that mm-hmm, you have. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the sun's still shining. Those are, those are yeah. kind of my favorites, but, uh, but definitely the title track, man. So guys, if you guys have not checked out, uh, Brian Hunt's music, please go check it out. Um, just look them up on Spotify uh, and we'll link everything up in the show notes as well uh, below. But you guys will, you guys will really like his style. If you like kind of like the Americana kind of, uh, you know, um, country uh, style, like he has a very unique voice and just, uh, I, I love it, man. Great, great job on the album. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'm glad, yeah, uh, glad the family liked it too. Yeah, dude, for sure. For sure there. And I heard Ethan singing the song, dude. He only heard it like once and he was yeah. singing Leaving You the other day. Like he was, it was just, it just stayed. So that's good. cool, man. It, that it's awesome. cool. The the kids will be honest with you about what, um, what the good ones are, right? Yeah. Which ones they like, which is, yeah. They, oh, for sure. They, they have, have no culture. Culture. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's hot. So, so with that being said, right, what I want to talk to you about is, um, one of the guys that, that I like to listen to and watch a lot is Myron Golden. Mm. Uh, and he, he kind of offered this perspective, um, on the very first verse in the Bible, right? Where he says, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and he kind of unpacks that and he tells it, he, he poses the perspective that the first thing that God tells us about himself is that he's creative, right? right. That he's a creative being. 
Um, and he is the creator, the ultimate creator. And one of the things that used to happen to me going to church and, you know, doing the church thing is that if, if I would go to a service and I didn't feel moved by the preaching or the message, right. Or I didn't feel like crying during worship or emotional during worship or something like that. Or like I wasn't raising my hands and doing the whole thing. Um, I felt like I was doing something wrong. Like I wasn't drawing near to God or that, um, like maybe my relationship was flawed with him. Right. But then in that very vein, whenever I would go into my room and I would write a spoken word or I would write lyrics or I would create a piece of art, um, or even when I go up to speak, right. And preach or I engage in conversation, I can create an experience with someone where we really bond over the conversation that we're having mm-hmm. um, in this podcast, whatever I, I create, whenever I create something, man, that's when I feel closest to him. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I like, I, I feel closer to him. I feel like, like I'm tapping into to his creativity as well, right? The creativity that he put in me. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's kind of the same thing for you or how do you view that in terms of, you know, when you tap into your creative space to create songs and write music and do that whole thing? Yeah, I feel like um, when uh, I'll speak to the first thing first. Yeah. The um, the charismatic movement, you know, if you don't cry and jump around or something, then that's the legalistic side mm. of uh, of that. and talking about that for a second you know i want to walk with god when i'm on the the mountaintop when i'm climbing up or i'm climbing down when i'm in the valley you know yeah. i don't want to wait until i need him to start to have that relationship right and and that's a um, i don't know how to coin it other than that but it's you know mm. a, a relationship with someone love is not emotional right and uh it's an act and 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 it's a it's a faithful act so when it comes to having a relationship with god you know it it yeah sometimes you you have those those mountaintops and you know that that feeling that you get like in the charismatic movement and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but it can be a high that people come back for and whenever you're low you know, it's like, oh, I'm with God today. Hallelujah. You know, and it's like, well, yeah. maybe you're sick the next day. And then, you know, where's God at? You know, he's still there with you. He he can still be there with you. So I've seen people where they want to be with them on the on the mountaintop when everything's good or whenever, you know, it's the band aid Jesus, whenever something goes wrong, then they get down on their knees. And, and that's a good thing. Right. And and but just for me, I want the consistency. I want to walk with him every day. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a different thing. And, and, uh, I'm still perfecting that. Right. And work on that the rest of my life. As far as, um, the songwriting side, I feel like God made me to create and it's something that I have to do. It's not something that not like, a I gotta go write a song or it's just who I am. And yeah. I want to use my gifts and I'm still learning how to do that. Um, both from like a technical proficiency standpoint and from where do my gifts move the needle the most, uh, to impact others, you know, in a positive way. I'm still very much on that path of learning and understanding where I can use them best. But for me, whenever I create, I just go into like a flow state and it just kind of comes and, I have a process that's different than a lot of people. I usually write my stuff by myself. Uh, I'll think about something for three, six months, a year, five years. And then one day I'll just sit down and I'll write it usually front front to start, you know? And, um, and then there's other songs that take, you know, five years where to piece them together, <laughs> you know, too. Yeah, so they're sure. not all the same, but creating, so the this is this is the inflection point for me. Katie and I went to uh, my wife Katie and I went to Hawaii in 2015 and we spent a month there on Maui and 
we did this hike up one of the West Maui mountains and, and I was sitting up, you know, this kind of mountain looking out over the ocean and, and just thinking about that trip and how we were consuming, we're taking pictures and we're buying souvenirs and we're eating and we're doing all this stuff. And I was in college at the time and I was like, dude, I don't want to consume anymore. Like it's empty and I want to create, you know? And so I felt like God kind of called me to create on that day in Hawaii and to focus on five areas in my life, um, that, that were around creating. And so at that point I repositioned our lives to go after those five things and, and, um, to start the process of, you know, writing an album and doing all these other things. And, um, and to be honest, like I, I found the water industry and kind of made that an idol for a while in my life and did some stuff there and, um, still kind of wrestling with that a little bit, but, but yeah, that was the inflection point was Hawaii on that mountain thinking about consuming and wanting to move from consuming to creating. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And can you share what the five things are? The, the five things that you. Yeah. If I can see if I can remember them all, um, yeah. they've kind of in flux a little bit, but, uh, engineering because you know, you create mm. uh, music mm-hmm. like songwriting. There's different areas of that. Um, uh, you know, finances or, you know, cash flow streams. Um, and then the last two are, I'm not, I'm blanking on the last two right now. I need to go back and look at that list. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome, man. But they were always, uh, they're, they were all in the field of creation, right? Like becoming yeah. a producer versus a consumer, right? And, and yeah. And then I had that, the thought, yeah. like, because you always got to look in the mirror from the other side. Well, I'm going to create this stuff and then people are going to consume it, you know? And that's, yeah, the, that's the true. chicken or the egg, yeah. you know? And so, like, yeah. That, I don't know, man. That I don't have the answer to that, but I did have that thought. So, yeah, you, know, you just sparked the thought right now. Is uh, you know, I was watching uh, Matt's video yesterday in Apogee, right? And he was mm-hmm. talking about character and reputation, right? And and you know, a lot of the guys, a lot of even the mentors we've had, you know, a lot of them operate under the guise of like. Hey, I'm going to do this no matter what, no matter what anybody tells me, right? And I'm I don't care what other people think like about me and this and that, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a there's kind of a flip side to that coin, right? Because even like like even the people that that say I don't care what other people think about me, right? They still have a following and they still have it's like, you know what I mean? There's still people that care about what you, what you think. And they, there's still a reputation to be had there. So, um, it, you know, it just, it sparked that thought as to what extent, you know, do we hold the reputation in front of other people? And is it, is it important? Is it not important? Right. Or to what degree should it be important? Um, or, you know, when we say those things, like, cause even, you know, right now, like you were talking about being a consumer versus producer. Now you become a producer, you're putting music out and you want it to be consumed. Right. right. <laughs> you know, you want people to listen to it. You want people to like, if you throw a concert, you want people to come and watch your concert. And you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. but then in the same vein, like, do you want to care what people think? You know what I mean? Like, so I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just yeah, the, it the dichotomy of that is just kind of interesting to me. Yeah. yeah I think it's uh, two things. One is being authentic mm-hmm. and being the same in the environment you know, being true to your morals and who you are. Um, and then, you know, if you're creating something that you believe in and people are consuming it and it allows them the opportunity to have a thought process that they might not have had, you know, in, in a different way. I know music's done that for me or it allows them to, to relax or, you know, take a load off or whatever, then there's a benefit to it there. Some of it, you know, we can create it and we can put it out there. Um, from a from a from a writing standpoint, from from a recording standpoint, the way that I look at it is not to serve an audience, right? Mm. And I always look at it like, do I love this? Is this 
how I want to make this. And then I put it out. And then if people like it, that's good. And if they don't, then that's fine too. Yeah. But it's not about the consumption that way first, right? Obviously, there's nothing wrong with being successful. and But at the end of the day, like the not selling your soul, not selling out is me making art that's pure to how I want to make it with who mm -hmm. I want to make it and um in a way that I love and and that's that's how I've kind of made peace with that and yeah. I'm not going to write a song you know because I think it's going to make it on radio or something you know that's not the goal ever the goal yeah. is to make art that is pure and to use my voice that God gave me and that's it, you know, to create, have fun, enjoy it, and um, and put it out there and share it with the world too, you know. And if people like it, awesome. And if they don't, awesome too, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure. No, I like I like that as it, you know, because you're you're saying it's it's staying true to your character, right? Kind of like what Matt was saying is like if you stay true to your character and you hold the code and you have you operate on integrity and your values and morals are aligned and. Yeah, you know, then whatever you put out there is people are going to resonate with it or not, you know, and and that's that and that's it, man. That's all you can really do, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like that. I like that answer. Uh, so the American Dream, right? Yeah. The album. Um, what sort of sparked the the concept for the album? Um, and sort of the songs that you chose to be in the album. What what was your your thought process behind that? Yeah, so I I wrote the American Dream, the title track, and um, the way that it works for me is is I write songs and I'll go record them, and then it's a process, and then I kind of filter it down, and you have the individual song, and then how does it work together as a body of work, and what's the sequence, and you know what's the tempos and the keys and how does it flow and all this other stuff. And so I would say an indirect answer to that question is my first album was very introspective and about me. Right. And a lot of life experiences and, you know, bundled together and put out. And this album is a little bit more external looking, you know, and there's still, there's still, they're more current, right? Where the last album was like 10 years old, 15 years old, you know, writing mm. about stuff where this album is more, most of it is, you know, happened in the last couple of years. So, um, it, it's hard to put into words. It's a process and it's a, a tenuring, it's a testing it's a living with, it's a, you know, re-recording re something 50 times sometimes, yeah. you know, it's getting the right second instrument or player to, to come on to the song to really round it out. And, um, so it's not like a, it's like a jungle gym. It's not like a ladder is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. And, mm -hmm. And so I started with the American dream in the sense of that was going to be the title track. And then I kind of backed into it from there. Gotcha. And, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Kind of so when you're, when you're writing, right. Do you, do you normally have, are you, the, are you the type of guy that wants the music, at least the, the guitar part? first and you listen to the music and then you put words on that or do you usually write the words or do you do it together like what, what's your process usually it depends man a lot of times yeah. i'll write the words first um sometimes it's the music and the words at the same time hmm. it's not usually the music first and then the words but that does happen gotcha. yeah more often than not it's the music and the words at the same time i'll get an acoustic guitar hmm. and just start working you know on an idea and I'll flesh it out, you know, pen and paper, guitar, and then I'll move into logic and then I'll, you know, set the 
set the form of the song and yeah. put some drums in there and and then I'll lay down a scratch guitar track and and then I'll start recording the vocal. And a lot of times the vocal that I record there is what ends up on the album. It's like the demo vocal. Wow. And uh but that process of recording it then I refine it a little more and I'll tweak this phrasing or that phrasing and how this is said and you can listen back and you know hear different things and and then it usually goes on a shelf for 35 days or some arbitrary amount of time and then eventually end up in a studio getting real drums put on it and you know maybe some bass and guitar and then it just it's for me it's very much a you know a crock pot slow cooking yeah. process not a uh, not a you write it and record it in the same day and put it out you know the next day not not a nashville approach yeah not that there's anything wrong with that but it's just not typically my my um my process yeah no, i like that yeah it's so different man than uh hip-hop right because <laughs> with with us with me man it was always like you know i heard the beat like i just played the beat over and over and over and then i would just sit there and try to write you know my lyrics to the beat and it was just it was the same kind of thing like listening to the beat 50 100 times just mm -hmm. on the loop um and then that was thing you know and then the beat would usually spark some sort of um uh, idea around you know the topic of the song or like the the uh the even the title of the song right and all that so it's just uh, I, I was just curious to see what your process was like but uh yeah it's much more much more nuanced than than my uh <laughs> sitting down and writing a rap bro <laughs> yeah it's yeah uh, it's a journey sometimes for sure man all right bro so uh i'm gonna leave you here with i'm gonna hit you with the last question that i usually hit all my guests with right okay um so in your experience in um working with men working with people in general right uh and now that you have your own family to lead you know if you'd had to narrow it down to a few traits what makes a dad a great family leader yeah being a christian is the main thing and really trying to serve and follow Jesus, I think, is the most important aspect. Um, that includes dying to self, right? And putting your wife and your kids before you, serving them and helping them grow into who they need to be. Um, it's a good question, man. Providing, protecting, being present. Yeah. Um, pointing them towards Jesus that that would be um, you know obviously love yeah no, I appreciate it man um, yeah man I agree like it's uh, having your know, faith in God faith in Christ and um, definitely at the at the forefront and then um, all the other things that come along with that right like you said dying to self and mm -hmm. um, being the protector the provider uh, loving on your family, spending time with your family. And, um, it's always interesting to see, you know, what the answers are that, that, that everybody that comes on the show gives. And, uh, and I, and I think there isn't a right or wrong. I think it's just like, they're all kind of, you know, uh, coming to get like all the answers come together because they all add different components to it. And, you know, that's why I like asking that question as the end, because, uh, it just gives you another perspective from another family leading man that, um, that gives you another trait that you can add or another few traits that you can add to your mm -hmm. arsenal, you know, as a, as a yeah. family leader, because, uh, it's all essential, man. Um, this whole family game is not easy <laughs> and it's, uh, and it's important, I think for us to have, uh, other good men like yourself to look up to and, and to not only look up to, but also to go side by side with, uh, through, throughout this journey, man. Cause, uh, I think we've, as men have been siloed for too long, uh, you know, in, in our own kind of echo chambers of, you know, whether it's our family or our close knit circle and uh, expanding and understanding that there's other men out there, um, maybe not geographically close, but, you know, there's other men out there that are struggling with the same things that you're struggling with. And um, they're having the same issues and they're trying to do the same things. They're trying to conquer themselves and 
uh, trying to be, you know, better dads, better husbands uh, for their families as well. So um, you are not alone, gentlemen. If you are listening to this, you are definitely not alone. We're all in this and no one that comes on this show, um, including myself, is perfect in any of these areas. Like we're still a work in progress and we are uh, moving forward to try to better ourselves every day, you know, and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up, you know, but I think the the more we can learn from those mistakes and, you know, the failures that we've had and the more we can learn from mistakes that even other men have made and, and we can avoid those pitfalls as well, um, just the better equipped we're going to be to be able to handle um, the responsibility, the duty that God has placed before us to to have a family. Not Not all men get to do that. So, yeah, it's a big responsibility and it's worth trying to get right. And to sum it up, having a strong moral foundation to go off of, you know, cause otherwise you're just out there on your own and that's not always a good place to be. And community, yes, right. You said you mentioned community a little bit. So that's iron sharpens iron. Yes, sir. Yep. That brotherhood is real, man. <laughs> yeah man well brother i want to thank you for coming on the show man um would love to do this again with you uh we could dive into some other topics uh as well um but yeah man i appreciate you coming on dude uh and pouring into these guys uh and sharing uh the talent that you have as well and, and sharing uh you know your your album with us and you know i hope we can get more people to support it and listen to it and uh you know for it to make an impact on them as well and uh, have their five-year-old son start uh, rocking and singing leaving you and the american dream and all that stuff <laughs> yeah man i appreciate that it's been a been a pleasure and an honor on my end and I, i'm really uh humbled to be here g so appreciate you man love you dude yeah. love you too brother thank you for checking out my interview with brian hunt if you found any of this valuable all i ask is that you share it with another family man who could benefit from it I've linked all of Brian's info in the show notes below. Please go check out his new album, The American Dream, out now wherever you get your music from. All right, my fellow Alpha Dad, I'll catch you on the next one. One, two, three, actions I didn't meet. Four, five, six, fear and silence begin to mix. Seven, eight, nine, the thought of being emotionless started taking over my mind.